So that brings us to uh, surgical treatments. And the problem now is that there's so much stuff on the internet that the patients can't filter through it. And a lot of it is uh, unethical, and a lot of it is a bait and switch. You know, they tell you they're going to do this procedure, you're going to be better in a day, and you get there, oh, you're not a candidate for it, or we couldn't do it, um, or, you know, you're just not complying with, with what we want you to do. <clears throat> Minimally invasive surgery is... Um, Really, the, the way most people are going now, what we call minimally invasive, you, you can't be too minimally invasive and put this in, in this. <laughs> it's really, you know, it can't be done arthroscopically, <clears throat> despite what somebody might say on the internet. <clears throat> so they talk about muscle sparing approaches. <clears throat> but if you look at the anatomy here around the hip joint, there's really not a way to get in there that's <clears throat> not covered by muscles. And every approach that's starting to expose the hip there, you've seen that muscles are cut somewhere. And some friends of mine at the Mayo Clinic uh, did some studies in the cadaver lab. And they did a variety of minimally invasive approaches and did the total hip. And then they opened it up widely to see what the outcome was. And they found the abductors down the canal, stuffed in with the stem. They found muscles cut. They found actually more muscle damage frequently than with a small incision standard approach. So most people are doing a small incision standard approach, either anterolateral or posterolateral. And um, they vary a little bit. You have to deal with the external rotators if you go posterolateral. You have to deal with the front of the gluteus medius if you go anterolateral. Uh, there's this stuff now, the Hanna table, where they, people are dislocating the, the hip off the back of the table. The back of the table drops away, and they're coming in anterior, anteriorly and saying they're not cutting any muscle. But you have to get through the tensor. I guess I don't have a pointer. Anyway, you have to get through the tensor fascia. It's on the other slide. And the abductors somehow to get down there, or the, rota or the external rotators are somehow to get, to get down there. And so they have to cut something and pull it out of the way. And there are higher incidence of uh, nerve injury and complications associated with some of these uh, so-called minimally invasive approaches. So for the sake of getting better two weeks earlier, are you going to compromise the position of your components or have a nerve injury or something else? Then there's the question of technology. Uh, there's a variety of technologies available. The gold standard is, um, you all probably know what a total hip is. We put a socket in, we put a ball and stem in. This is longer than, this is a longer stem, but uh, it's a normal length stem here would be like that. Take out the head of the hip, those made together. So the gold standard was metal on um, plastic, <coughs> uncemented uh, stems now. We pretty much are getting away from cement unless the patient's osteoporotic, and that would be cement on the femur. I don't think anybody really is cementing sockets anymore because the uncemented sockets have done very well, regardless of bone quality, generally. Um, <clears throat> so the problem, is not, it's, the problem is not that there's not enough plastic there. That, there's enough plastic there to last a long time. The problem is that it gives off little particles as it wears, and the body eats the particles. And when it eats the particles, if there's a bone cell next to it, it might eat the bone cell, too. And you get what we call osteolysis, or bone loss. Now, <clears throat> so they went, they tried metal on metal, try and get away from that. There's concern about metal ions, because metal on metal gives off metal ions. There's concern about metal ions being picked up by the kidney and being toxic, or by the bloodstream and being toxic. Now there's concern, there's the seven year data is showing a fairly high incidence in some cases of osteolysis in the metal on metal. And then there's an immune reaction that, a f that some people have gotten more common in women. Uh, which, is, which is sort of catastrophic. They get an immune reaction in the soft tissues, and it just sort of eats away the abductors. And nobody really knows exactly what it is, but it seems to be an autoimmune uh, phenomenon. They started about 10 years ago irradiating the plastic to make it stronger. And that's working out very well. The original data suggested that it would reduce the wear by half. In fact, it's probably reduced it to about a quarter at 10 years of what would have been expected. 
Whether that's going to change, you know, the next 10 years it could accelerate, we don't really know, but right now that's looking pretty good and people are enthusiastic about that. Ceramic on ceramic, uh, the ceramic heads have still had some problems with breakage. Uh, you've heard the stuff about squeaking. I think it's pretty much been decided that the squeaking is in the metal, in the ceramic cup, you still have a metal stem. You have a ceramic ball, ceramic cup. Frequently the neck of the prosthesis can impinge on the edge of the cup. If it rubs on the plastic, it may create a little wear, but it's not going to do anything to the metal. Ceramic is harder than the metal, so it scratches the metal. Those little metal filings deposit on the ceramic head, and that's, again, at the Mayo Clinic they did some studies, and the only way they could reproduce that squeaking was to get uh, metal filings deposited on the head. So, <clears throat> so that's controversial. And uh, I think, you know, people are you know, pretty happy about the irradiated plastic. Some people are still experimenting with metal metal. And uh, now people are experimenting with a ceramic ball and a metal liner trying to reduce the amount of metal metal. And now they have ceramic metal and who knows what that's going to do. So long-term success, 95% of them still doing fine 25 years later. It has probably, now that we're talking about healthcare costs, one of the best benefit to cost ratios, it gets, you know, it gets the patients back in the workplace, back in the community.